I'm looking at the key from a dictionary, and then I'm checking to see whether that key, uh, whether the, the result that I got indicates that the lookup was successful. If so, I return it, and if not, I'm falling back to just pulling it off of the web. This is reasonably, this is reasonably functional code. This works, it's idiomatic scheme-ish. But it has a problem, which is that it's insufficiently abstract. If I find myself doing this kind of check fallback thing a lot, I'm going to discover that it's tedious to write and my fingers get tired. But worse, I'm going to start making mistakes. So I need some abstraction. I can't use a function to perform this abstraction, though, because I wind up passing get from web k as an argument to a function. The side effect of going to the web and doing something is going to be repeated even in the cases when it's not part of the semantics that I want. So I need some other kind of abstraction. And that's what metaprogramming is for. Metaprogramming is this general, powerful technique that allows us to programmatically create or modify programs. Here, uh, my metaprogramming system has expanded the OR macro into the code on the previous slide. It has saved me, the programmer, the effort from, of actually programming. It's great. It's powerful. So let's use it again. <clears throat> now I'm doing something that involves the ambient temperature. I'm checking my internal thermometer, but I don't trust the hardware, so I'm going to fall back to using a default temperature if the, if the hardware check fails. What I hope that this code means is, well, the same thing it meant on the previous slide, checking, falling back. But what I probably get is something totally different. Here, I have code that's doing the wrong thing. If I'm lucky, it's just going to crash. If I'm unlucky, it'll do the wrong thing silently, and um, it'll appear as a mysterious bug report that I can't track down, or it'll just go unnoticed and continue making my user's lives slightly worse, and they'll never discover it. This problem is bad. This problem is also common. A recent survey of metaprogramming systems found that eight out of the nine that were looked at had problems like this. So we need to do something about problems like this, and the first thing we need to do is to define what we mean by a problem like this. I say that a language should be binding safe. I, I shouldn't have been punished for the fact that I happen to have chosen a slightly short and uncreative variable name. Um, what I really mean by this is that, as a general rule, it should be possible to perform any kind of renaming on input code, pass it through your metaprogramming system, and whatever the metaprogrammer did, the output should always be the same up to possibly some renaming on the other end. Alpha equivalent inputs should produce alpha equivalent outputs. This isn't a new idea. Um, we're building our work off of pure fresh ML, um, which also has this property, as do many of its predecessors. Um, these, these things all preserve binding safety, and I should be happy. But I'm not, because these languages only support simple binding forms like lambda and left, and maybe slightly more complicated things. Um, and I want to use complicated <coughs> binding forms. So do you, probably. Here are a couple of examples in two different languages. On the left, I have some racket code in which I'm using the left star construct to do some sort of successive approximation thing, starting binding A to a zeroth approximation, B to a refinement of that, and so on. When I bind A here, it's going to be bound in the body of the left star, so that I can refer to it. I don't actually refer to it in the printf, but I could. Um, and it's also going to be bound in all of the successive um, in all of the successive clauses. So this binding is sort of going in two directions at once. On the SML side, I'm using the local uh, the the local construct to to take a stand in the pi tau debate. Here I'm defining tau in terms of pi, but only tau is going to actually be available in the um, in the top level namespace. These are both forms that we would like to be able to use and that can't be manipulated by these existing systems. So to this end, we've developed a programming language, which is binding safe, just like all the others, and it also is capable of handling binding forms that have much more complexity than before. Um, we've, given a, we've developed a notation to express these bindings, we've given a, a clear big step semantics, and we've shown it to be binding safe with a proof of correctness which we made as succinct as possible, and it's 20 pages. 
We call our we call our language Romeo. Romeo is of course a reference to the work of a great nominal logician who once said, "What's in a name? That which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet." Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the first step is we need to find a way to actually represent binding in Romeo. Uh, here's the left star example again. Uh, first thing we should do is parse it. So our parse tree shows that left star is just a pair, and all of the structure is inside the declarations. The declarations we're saying in this parse tree are triples. They've got an atom, an expression, and either the next declaration or the end of the line. So that's great. Let's start by talking about how names get bound in these new scopes in the first place. This feature is called imports. And we're going to say that in the left star, the decal, the declaration, is imported by the expression. This means that the declaration is going to provide some names for the expression um, and that's how A, B, and C get bound there. Then in each of the declarations, the name that that declaration binds is going to be bound inside the next declaration. So that's how the names move on down the line. Simple. But I cheated. When I said that, a name, that the name on the left-hand side of the declaration is getting bound on the, um, in the next declaration, that makes sense. When I said that the names from the declaration were getting bound in the expression, I cheated and didn't say what names I meant. So the next thing is, I need to say what names I mean when I try to use something to bind names somewhere else. And that's what exports are for. So we're going to say that in Romeo, um, in order to express this let star, we're going to have each of these declarations export both the name that it binds and all the names exported by the next term. Now we've actually described the binding structure that left star has. We just need to take it from being arrows on a slide to being an actual notation. Um, in Romeo, we express binding information in the types of values, these values being terms of the program that we're manipulating. And a left star expression is a pair of a declaration and an expression. So we'll notate it by this. Prod is just our notation for a product of one of zero or more um, items. Or we're just going to say that the expert I that the expert subterm is going to import from the zeroth position. Um, we're using numbers here just because we don't need another naming system on top of all the names we already have. <coughs> uh, so this works. Our notation for import we just attach to each of the subterms. And then we just need a notation for export to deal with these cases. So now we have a triple, three things. We have an import like before. And we're also exporting uh, the, from the zero and I guess the tooth position. I'm not sure about this zero based indexing thing. Um, we're exporting both of those things. We're treating, for the purposes of this thought, I'm treating these um, imports and exports as though they were sets of numbers. Um, in fact, we care about shadowing whether shadowing should happen, and if so, in what direction. The good news is that, that's, um, that if you just like do the obvious thing, it works. So you don't need to worry about that. So shadowing information is in there, but it's hidden for our purposes. We've, discovered, we've discussed what binding is happening. We still need to define alpha equivalents. So what makes two left stars alpha equivalent to each other? Well, we'd like our definition of binding to be as compositional as possible, which means that we'd like it to depend on whether two declarations are alpha equivalent to each other. What does this mean? Well, it's a little bit unusual because these declarations have exports. But it turns out that we want two alpha equivalent declarations to be completely indistinguishable from each other, um, or else it wouldn't be a very good alpha equivalence. And you can definitely tell what names are being exported by a term by attempting to use it in a binding. So we need to require that for two, in, for two things that export names to be alpha equivalent, the binders that they export need to be um, counted, need to be exactly equal. And this means that if you sort of like run through all the theorems that we'd like to be true about alpha equivalence and free names, the exported binders happen to be free names, which is a little bit weird, but it gets us this nice property that in Romeo, all subterms of a term 
are first class, just like the term that they were. First class from the point of view of having a defined notion of output equivalence. So that's cool. We haven't talked about how we actually make Romeo go in a safe fashion. There are two problems to the way that Romeo um, static, to, to the way that Romeo enforces the binding safety guarantee that we proved. The first thing is we need to avoid name clashes. Um, and Romeo is going to automatically perform some kind of renaming in order to avoid name collisions. I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a moment. The other thing is we need to prevent names from just We've, we've shown, we can show that names aren't getting bound to the wrong thing. We also want names to actually be bound. Um, and Romeo does this by creating a dynamic, a dynamic error whenever a name is left unbound. I'll talk more about how that works um, in a moment also. But I wanted to bring this up because I also want to say that Romeo has a deduction system which allows you to statically show that these dynamic errors don't take place. And if the deduction system gives your program the okay, then you have a program that does that is statically binding, say, which is great. Okay, so here's a little fragment of Romeo. I'm just doing some ordinary destructuring using um, what may be semi-familiar uh, Lisp syntax. Um, I'm assuming that our environment contains something called STX, which I'm going to tell you happens to be uh, lambda that binds a to um, that binds a. Um, and now I'm going to destructure it. I'm just saying I expect to see some kind of lambda. I'm going to um, bind its atom to whatever the name was that was bound, and the thing, and I'm going to bind expert to whatever the body of the lambda is. Um, now, what Romeo is going to do is it's going to look at this value right before I destructure it and say, what are the names that are bound in this value, but that are going to be exposed once I break this value open? And in this case, there, is no, there are no free names in this value, SDX, but A is going to become free in Adam and in Expert. So Romeo is going to automatically perform a rename to make, sure that the, to make sure that those names don't clash with any names in the environment. So if A is already in the environment, it might get renamed to B in both of the children. We have the same binding structure. This was our last chance to safely rename it in order to maintain the binding structure and avoid a clash. So that's how we avoid clashes. But we also want to make sure that the name, that names actually get bound in a timely fashion. So the other part of making our correctness guarantee work is making sure that it's not possible to return from the right-hand side of a destructuring construct a name free that the destructuring construct exposed. The intuition for this roughly is that this is our last chance to give these names some kind of meaning before they escape into the outside world. Um, so just returning Adam here would be an error. On the other hand, binding lambda b dot b, that's going to be perfectly fine. And that's good because putting atoms, it, because putting free names into binding structures is the only way we have of making use of their structure in the first place. So I'd like to show you a little bit of code. The left star I showed you previously, well, we'd like to be able to make that a macro, expand it away. So let's assume that we have some program in STX, which is written in the lambda calculus, augmented with left star. And we want to translate it into the plain old lambda calculus. We do it this way. I'm skipping over the cases where we hit, say, a lambda, and we need to transform it into a lambda. I'm looking only at the case that's actually interesting. So let's start with the base case of our recursion, where we see a left star that doesn't have any, um, that doesn't have any declarations. Well, that's just a body. So, in fact, this was an easy case also. In the case where we have a um, value being bound to something and a potentially, a potentially long list of declarations afterwards, we're going to do a little bit more work. The first thing is we take care of the list of declarations um, by, just, by just telling the expander to go ahead and expand the rest of them. Um, and then we need to actually bind x. So we wrap the whole thing in a lambda x that binds whatever name is associated with x in decals and body. This gets our binding in the place that we want it to be. We just need to actually do the semantically right thing and have it be associated with a value. So we take this function we created and we immediately build a function call around it. So we've built up a function call that gets val as an argument 
And we've now expanded let star away using nothing but lambda and function invocation. So this is sort of the bog standard way of um, doing an expansion for a let star in a macro system like rackets, say. <coughs> uh, but the exciting thing is that in racket, you would run into trouble, for example, exp expanding a let. Um, you can see that we you can see that we wrap this lambda x around the decals, which means that the name associated with x will be bound in the declarations after it. Um, if you don't want that binding to happen in racket, uh, like Romeo, that's the language that we're working in. Um, if you don't want that binding to happen in Romeo, you actually only need to change the type. If we had changed the type of STX to reflect the to reflect that we wanted let style binding, instead of let star style binding, we would get exactly the same thing. And that's kind of exciting. What the user is doing here, by doing this, is taking advantage of our, um, of our safety theorem by um, knowing that the expansion is going to do whatever renaming is necessary to ensure that names don't get bound to the wrong thing. And so this makes it possible to write more succinct code just by saying, I don't want this to be bound. You figure out how to do the renaming around it. And so I think that's pretty exciting. The other thing that you, <clears throat> the other thing that I want to say about this uh, about this code example is that um, it's is that like, like I said, it's sort of a standard way of expanding away a macro and bracket or scheme or list. Um, but there are a lot of things that you can do in Romeo. In fact, you can do anything in Romeo safely that you can't do in um, an ordinary hygienic macro system like Scheme. It's like you're not allowed to, uh, it's like ordinary, ordinarily macrologists will say, no, 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 don't go searching through your input to find, to, to see if there are any references to a name that you're interested in. Pick those up because they might be inside a binding conflict which changes the meaning. But in Romeo, all the quality comparisons that you can possibly do are equality of the actual structure of the input code. And that means that you can do whatever you want and not have to worry about whether it's going to happen to be unhygienic. And I think that that's pretty exciting. So that's all I have to say about Romeo. Um, I, I hope that it or one of its descendants in the glorious future is going to bring you metaprogramming joy. Thank you. Questions? Please approach the microphone. Please tell your name. Uh, I think I have two questions. So first of all, I think that your notion of alpha, well, your safety criteria is a little bit restrictive because, for example, if I have the Bruyne indices, I will get automatically alpha naming free, right? But mm -hmm. there are also problems in the Bruyne indices. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. And the second, I think also uh, this the conclusion a little bit broad because, for example, in metaprogramming, we want to have effects and we want to have, for example, store code with open variables mm -hmm. and uh, retrieve it in a code in a different binding environment. And so you, have, you can have errors not only where some variables accidentally left unbound, but you have some ca cases where some variables accidentally get bound. Mm -hmm. And even if you rename it, because you can import and export in several times in the different binding structures. And I don't observe in the code, in, in your presentation, how we deal with this problem. When so, you have effects. Um, we, so Romeo is a side effect free language. Um, yeah, we, haven't, so we haven't worried about that. But you're talking about effects in the, in the meta language? Yes. Um, I'm having a hard time visualizing the situation. Maybe we need to like hash it out and finish well, it. Well, I mean, situation but... very easily. For example, if you want to program code where exchange order of the loops, or for example, you want to do loop invariant code or motion. Mm -hmm. For example, you have the code, you program loops, you you introduce the loop construction, and you decide, oh well, this code kind of doesn't depend on this variable. I'd rather move it out. Right, right. But you, of course, you have to be sure that you, you know, don't accidentally move code that does refer to the loop variable. Correct. I believe that that case is handled is going to be handled automatically. Um, the nice thing about programming with names is that when you break something open, you just stick it into the environment, and you're not worried about the scope. You sort of like have this big. The environment is just this big scope well, in which the names are binding each other. Well, I think you might be oversimplifying. Perhaps, but the nice thing is that you that when you pull out that name into the big scope, 
it's not going to clash with anything. You know that it's going it, to. No, it does. And I can show you examples. Um, OK, I'd love to see them. Michael Adams, University of Utah. Uh, two questions. One, is Romeo online so I can play with it and download it? or? No, I, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll definitely give you a copy, and I will see if I can convince my advisor to just make the um, GitHub repository public, or at least that we can just release the source code. Um, the implementation that we have of Romeo is out of date with the formalism, um, but I don't believe that it would be too much work to get it back in line. And if there's any interest, it's certainly worth doing. So my real question is, this looks very similar to um, David Herman's yes. work. Yes. So what's the difference? What's the so difference? Lambda M is the other influence that we have, um, and Lambda M is and Lambda M is wonderful, except that it's not a is a macro system that's not a procedural macro system. So you can do pattern matching. Um, so you can do pattern matching with complex binding perfectly safely, um, and then you sit down and you say, okay, I'm going to write all kinds of great macros with this, and then you realize, wait a second, I need a little bit more power, um, and you, as like schemers, inevitably say, okay, pattern, start with pattern matching macros, and then they say, okay, shoot, I need to get, go to syntax case. And we give you syntax case. Phil Waldler, University of Edinburgh. I wanted to begin with the thank you. Two thank yous, actually. This is cool work. Thank you. Um, no, that was my thank you to you. <laughs> uh, but the other thank you is because you began with a concrete example. <laughs> Which, uh, I'm hoping I'll, to see many more talks here that begin with concrete examples as you did. You should you should thank the uh, the the harsh criticism the original version of this talk received from my peers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you to your peers. Also, a question about related work, mm -hmm. um, very similar to the previous question. I know enough to know the phrase hygienic macro expansion, Aha. but you didn't mention that buzzword, so I'm wondering how it relates to what you're talking about. I did not. So I alluded to it, but not by name, when I said that you can do things in Romeo that would be wildly unsafe in Scheme or Racket. Um, in general, hygienic macro expansion is this nice tool that sort of protects individual macros from each other, which is great if you're writing small macros and um, you're not doing anything particularly fancy. But uh, what schemers and racketeers and macrologists of all stripes discover when they use macro systems in a complicated way is that if your macro system gets, if your macro that you're writing gets larger and larger, there's less and less protection. In the extreme case, if you have a program that's just one big complex macro invocation, the macro system, the, the hygiene system doesn't do anything. It's about protecting macros from each other, not about keeping an individual macro from tripping on its own feet. Thanks. Thank you. Nicolas Bouillard from um, IT University of Copenhagen. Um, I would like to ask you if, if you make a very simple macro that would recursively, let's say, just copy a term, right? Go down the lambda and make new lambdas. Mm -hmm. uh, because of your eager uh, uh, freshening, what kind of complexity do you get on this kind of costly identity function? Aha! Um, so the complexity of expanding Romeo code in general is, I believe, going to be, um, is potentially n squared because you have these terms of size n, you descend into it every time you need to do a big, wide renaming. So we have a performance problem. Um, the good news is that the, um, is that the, the hygienic macro systems of um, Scheme that I've been just crashing um, happen to have almost exactly the same situation where you have a bunch of you're descending through something, you rename it each time, and this gets you into trouble. Um, but, um, especially in the performance sensitive days in which they originated, they, um, they made a big deal about finding a solution to this problem. And that is to delay the actual substitution until you, um, and that is to sort of like perform the actual substitution lazily. So you take, a, um, you take the substitutions that you want to perform Instead of performing them, you just wrap the syntax in something that says, I need to do the substitution here. Worry about it when you have to. And then um, you sort of like just keep things consistent as you keep on going. So we don't know for sure, but we think that the same technique could work for this for Romeo also. Yeah, this, this delaying and uh, substitution has, has some other issues because then you end up duplicating uh, this uh, substitution composition. And, and sometimes it's just you're just uh, duplicating work that will that will uh, that will be done on the 
on the variables where you actually force the substitution. So it's not always a, mm -hmm. a good deal. This uh, that's this, uh, true. I mean, they got a different performance characteristic out of it, so they clearly so they clearly did the right thing. Um, I don't know if there are any. There is possible that there are properties of Romeo that would prevent that, but I don't. My gut says that there aren't any. Uh, I don't know. I can't. I've never been able to successfully cite my gut. Though, so. Sure. Uh, Carl Eastland, Jane Street. Um, so the racket macro system, well, as you point out, doesn't have all the guarantees of uh, Romeo. It has a lot of expressive power. It's been used to build a hierarchy of language, some with type, <coughs> some with lazy evaluation, etc. So how much of that expressiveness does Romeo have, and how much of that does it not yet cover? Um, so do you mean, are you concerned about expressiveness in terms of interesting binding structures, or are you concerned about um, expressiveness in terms of the things that you can do with, um, the things that you can do just by manipulating code? Um, let's say the interesting binding structure, which I think what we're trying to address. So we're never going to have, um, we're never going to have the same power um, of just plain old being unsafe and letting whatever happen. Um, the, uh, for the, but your question is really presumably about uh, about like whether we can whether we can <coughs> represent all kinds of practical things, um, and the answer is that Romeo still doesn't that Romeo still doesn't have a great story for all <coughs> racket macros that one could possibly want. Um, we have good reason to believe that some of these are simple extensions, um, but that's um, but that's sort of future work. Um, but it will necessarily be a but like. Uh, talking about binding structure will necessarily be a matter of sort of catching up to what kinds of binding structures people want. Because once you enter the world of having to say what you mean when you're binding, you have to also restrict the language of saying what you mean. Because you don't want a, well, I can't, I shouldn't generalize and say that you don't want a programming language in your type system, because sometimes you do. But <laughs> we don't want to require that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Can I have one sentence? Uh, uh, yes. yes. Uh, when I when we phrase hygiene as a macro property, a good property, we really thought of it as a right default. Mm -hmm. Programmers must always have the power of escaping. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Carl was getting at. I see. Um, I think that there may also be a story for building macros that we traditionally think of as completely unhygienic. But again, this is just my gut saying that, oh, you should probably be able to say in the type, I bind the name this, but I don't know. Thank you. So we thank Paul again.